family, Pastor Darius back with a message called This Is My Last Nerve. You gotta check this out, man. This is one of the most important messages in this Managing Meltdown series. I want you to tap in and listen to me, man. If it blesses you, be a blessing to somebody else. Send it to somebody. I love you. Enjoy the message. Take care. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell face down. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, and gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock. Somebody say speak. speak. Okay, speak to that rock before their eyes. They need to see you speak. And it, meaning the rock, will pour out water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen, you rebels. Must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock. Wait a minute. God said, speak. Moses struck. Some of you thinking, P.D., give him a break. It was an accident. He struck the rock twice with his staff. But water brushed out, gushed out, and the community and the livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of Israel, you will not bring this community into the land that I give them. I want to stop reading right there and I want to use as a subject for today's sermon, this is my last nerve. This is my last. Clap your hands if you believe God's going to speak to us in our time together today. Family, as I was preparing for this presentation on today, I remembered a book that I read several years ago that uniquely impacted my perspective on progress. And the name of the book was called The Compound Effect. And The Compound Effect family is simply a principle that suggests where small, consistent actions or changes, when repeated over time, can lead to significant and exponential Results. One more time. Small, consistent actions or changes over time can lead to significant and exponential results. One more time. Small, come on, consistent actions or changes when repeated over time can lead to significant and exponential. I don't know if you know what I mean when I say exponential. Even if you're not clear on what exponential is, you need to be excited about exponential. Because whether you know it or not, all of us want God to do something exponentially in our life. Come on and talk to me. Yeah, see, when God does it exponentially, it's not addition. When God does it exponentially, it's multiplication. It's when he says, you are no longer in the season of adding. You have stepped into the season of multiplying. And I want to know, am I talking to anyone that's believing God is getting ready to multiply? You didn't talk back to me like you believed it. That he's getting ready to multiply joy, multiply opportunities, multiply strength, multiply favor, 
multiply your team, multiply your money, multiply your mind, exponential. But you don't experience exponential, pursuing exponential. Small, consistent actions or changes over time lead to significant and exponential results. This book revolutionized my perspective on progress because it showed me you don't experience drastic changes by pursuing drastic changes. That you experience drastic changes by implementing small changes and maintaining those small changes consistently over a period of time, then your consistency compounds. And you look up and you step into a season of multiplication and you don't even know it. You look up and you got skill sets and you didn't even know you were this skilled. You look up and you done messed around and got good at something and you don't even know how you got good. You look up and you've messed around and you've got stronger and you don't even know where this strength came from. It was a exponential experience because consistency compounds. And those who understand and embrace this principle understand that I may not be able to change my destination overnight, but I can change my direction. I can't change my spiritual state tomorrow, but I can change my spiritual disciplines today. And if I change my spiritual disciplines today, it's going to change my spiritual state one day. Can't change my relationship overnight, but we can change the way we start treating each other today. And if we change the way we start treating each other today, it's going to change our relationship tomorrow. I can't change my body overnight, but I can change what I'm putting in it today. And if I start keep changing what I'm putting in it and keep it up consistently, I'll look up and it'll change my body. It's the compound effect. And when the devil can't stop you and I from doing the right thing, his next step is to try to get us to do the right thing the wrong way. If he can't, if he can't keep you, Numbers 13, with a grasshopper mentality where you're small-minded, what he will do is, when he can't stop you from wanting to do big things, he'll try to get you and I to do big things the wrong way. And you don't do big things trying to do big things. You do big things by doing small things consistently over a period of time and that gives you the capability to do big things. And I'm telling you today that if you are willing to do small things like they big things, you'll hit a season where you can do big things like they small things. I said if you're willing to do small things like they big things, then you'll hit a season where you can do big things like they small things. If you are willing to do small things like they big things, you'll hit a season where you can do big things like they small things. If you are willing to take care of the lion and the bear when nobody's looking, then you'll be able to knock down Goliath when everybody's looking. Because consistency compounds. And this is why, I don't have time. And this is why the enemy is after your consistency. I'm doing a teaching, I'm doing a teaching this Saturday on Super Saturday with people who are in the parking team and the host team and some of our other teams on spiritual warfare because I want them, I want us as a church to demystify the spiritual, demystify spiritual warfare because the Bible says when we are ignorant of Satan's devices, he has an advantage over us. So some of us are looking for him in big things and you don't see the warfare in small things. We don't see that our struggle with consistency is an indication of warfare. That the enemy is fighting you in areas you don't even call the enemy. 
You just think it's a habit. You just think it's a hang up. You just think it's an issue. And I'm not trying to over spiritualize it, but it's a devil who doesn't want you to be consistent. So he fights you tooth and nail because he knows if you ever get consistent. He's after it. I say he's after it. I say he after it. I say he after it. I say he's after it. God doesn't have fear, but Satan does. And he attacks you the most in the area he's most afraid of you getting together. He said they gift it, but if I can keep them inconsistent, I can keep them ineffective. They're anointed, but if I can keep them inconsistent, I can keep them ineffective. God's got a plan for their life, but if I can keep them inconsistent, I can keep them from stepping into it. Well, the devil's getting ready to have a nervous breakdown today. I said the devil's getting ready to be mad today. He's getting ready to have a bad day today because God's getting ready to break the yoke of inconsistency off your life. I feel something falling off you today. I hear shackles hitting the ground. Once you got a revelation that it's the devil that's been after your consistency, you fight different. You pray different. You, you oh, this is the devil. I didn't know it was the devil. I thought it was a ha- oh. The compound effect. Consistency compounds. And if you will do small things like they're big things, eventually you'll be able to do big things like they're small things. And as I thought about this principle, I saw how it was pertinent, relevant, salient to these sermons I've been preaching regarding managing meltdowns. I saw a connection between the compound effect and meltdowns. I saw something. Y'all wanna know what I saw? I said, do you wanna know what I saw? I saw that meltdowns are a consequence of the compound effect. Cause every principle work both ways. Did you hear what I just said? The compound effect doesn't just apply to our life positively. The compound effect also applies to our life negatively. So if I ignore small issues consistently over time, then my ignoring of those small issues consistently over time leads to significant and exponential problems. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, if I ignore small issues consistently over time, then those issues compound and what started off as a snake in the book of Genesis ends up being a dragon in the book of Revelation and it's easier for me to defeat an issue when it's a snake than it is for me to defeat it when it's a dragon and some of us right now no judgment but we fighting dragons when we should have been fighting snakes y'all aren't talking to me it's a snake it's a snake when you could stop and you won't It's a dragon when you want to and you can't. Let me say that 
one more time. It's a snake when you, when you can stop it and you don't want to. It's a dragon when now you want to and you can't. This is why a sage named Solomon warns us in the Song of Solomon to catch it when it's small. He says in Song of Psalms 215, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyard. The devil is in the fox. Y'all aren't talking to me on this side. I said the devil is in the fox. It's in that little thing that seems inconsequential, in that little thing that doesn't seem to matter. And sometimes a major meltdown is a result of the mismanagement of minor foxes. And sometimes you end up on your last nerve and don't know it's your last one. And our text that we just read in Numbers is an example of what I'm trying to articulate. This text in Numbers exposes us to one of the most epic meltdowns in human history. It is the meltdown of a man named Moses. Pastor Darius, you've been talking about meltdowns for two weeks. You hadn't told us what a meltdown is. Well, here you go. <laughs> Better late than never. A meltdown is when a person acts unexpectedly in response to something they're experiencing emotionally that causes them to engage behaviorally in a way that is sabotaging their life or someone else's. I'm getting ready to show, this, show you this with Moses. It's when a person acts unexpectedly because they own their last ler- nerve and they don't know it's their last. In response to something they're experiencing emotionally that causes them to engage behaviorally in a way that is sabotaging their life or someone else's. This is what we see in this text with Moses. We just read it, it's uniquely interesting. The Bible says in verse six that Moses and Aaron had went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting. They fall face down. They have this authentic encounter with the glory of God. And God says something to Moses, very interesting. He said, I want you to take the staff, you and your brother, Aaron, gather the assembly together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. Wait a minute. God tell Moses, speak to something that don't have ears. Did you hear what I just said? Speak to something that don't have ears. And when you speak to something that don't have ears, I'm going to release something that you don't think you have. I know you and I have gone looking for water in a number of different places, but most of us have never gone looking for water in a rock. So he says, I want you to speak to something that don't have ears and I'm going to make it release something you don't know it have. And it's going to come out of an opening you can't see. Y'all are not talking back to me in the back. He said, just because, just because you don't see ears doesn't mean it don't have ears. Just because you don't see water in it doesn't mean it doesn't have water in it. And just because you don't see an opening don't mean I can't make a closed thing open up. I don't know who this is for, but somebody needs to be excited because God knows how to get through to something that don't have ears. He knows how to make something release something you don't know it has. And he knows how to make closed things open up. 
I don't know if a closed door, I don't know if it's a closed opportunity, I don't know if it's a closed mind, but God is getting ready. He say, uh, he say, Moses, you, you, don't, you don't know water in a rock. But some rocks are made because of water. And when it rains, rocks absorb water. You're just only accustomed to the water leaving a rock through the process of evaporation. But I'm going to make a rock do something it don't normally do to bless you. Because evaporation ain't the only way I can get water out of a rock. So God said to Moses, take Aaron and take your staff and go speak to the rock. Let the church say speak. speak. Come on, say it again. Say speak. speak. In Greek, that means speak. In Hebrew, that means speak. In Spanish, that means speak. In Dutch, that means speak. Come on now. He says speak. It's not rocket science. But I want y'all to see something in the text, guys. The text says, verse 7, the Lord says to Moses, then verse 8, take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, and gather the assembly together. Now, Marla, don't miss this. Marla, I think they about to miss it, Marla. Don't miss this. God is the one that told him to take the staff with him. Look at verse 8. I'm going to read it for you. <laughs> Moses took the staff. Come on. Excuse me. Verse, verse 7. The Lord says to Moses, take the staff. You and your brother Aaron and gather the assembly together. Moses thought that having it meant permission to use it. Let me go to this side. I'm just looking. I know we got all sorts of members. I'm just looking for my Pentecostal members right here. Yeah, I'm looking for a good quickening right here. Just because you have it doesn't mean you've got permission to use it. He said, Moses, I told you to carry it. That doesn't mean you've got permission to use it. So Moses takes the staff, and this is what he says. He says, listen, you rebels. Okay. He's talking to people, and God never told him to talk to people. God told him to talk to the rock. He's talking to who he think got ears. <laughs> Did you hear what I just, cause he don't trust that the rock will listen. What he didn't realize is that God had gone before him and made the rock amenable to his request. The rock that would normally be resistant to a request is now amenable to that request because God has made the rock ready for that request. But he goes to who he think got ears. Just drinking my water, minding my business. God, I'm not going to talk to them. God, I'm not going to ask them. 
I don't even like them. They don't even like me. They always tell everybody no. They selfish. They keep looking out for themselves. They rocks. Why would I tell them? They don't have nothing. They can't help me. You don't know who you sitting next to. You don't know what kind of water is in the rock that's sitting next to you. Just because I'm not bragging about it, just because I'm not talking about it, just because I'm not posting about it, does not mean it's not in me. Sleep on me if you want to. Stay thirsty if you want to. There's some water in me. So instead of speaking to the rock, he strikes the rock twice. Dear, this is what throw me off. And the Bible says he strikes the rock twice and water gushed out. I mean, it flowed out. I'm like, wait a minute. God says speak to it. You didn't speak to it. You struck it. And water still flowed. You disobeyed. And it still worked. Let that shake your theological tree. He did not do what God said. And it still worked. But the text doesn't just say water gushed out. Watch what the text says. The text says water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank whoop there it is right there see the water gushing out is not an indication of God's pleasure with Moses it's an indication of God's commitment to his people he said I'm not going to let them die of thirst because you disobeying me so I'm going to let this water flow because I'm going to make sure they get what they need. But after they get what they need, you and me are about to have a conversation. Water flows. And Moses like, look at me. Look at me. And God said, uh, come here for a minute. I'll let you. Okay. He said, bring Aaron with you. Aaron, like, what I got to do with this? <laughs> you looking at Moses, you always get me into something. He said, uh, come here. You know, when I called you, uh, I clarified your assignment and said your assignment was to lead Israel out of Egypt, lead them in an exodus out of Egypt and into promised land. All my conversations with you, Moses, were about promised land. But it seems to me, Moses, that you confuse an opportunity with an obligation. I'm not obligated. When I'm talking to you about the promised land, Moses, I'm giving you an opportunity. But I think you managing this opportunity like it's my obligation. Moses, you think I'm obligated to do this. I'm not obligated to do this. When I articulated to you, I wanted you to lead Israel into the promised land, I was articulating to you your potential. That's my preference for you. But my preference requires your participation. The fact that I am, the fact that I introduce myself to you as Jehovah, as the covenant keeping God, lets you know that covenants have conditions. I covenant to do my part. 
I need you to covenant to do yours. So Moses, now your punishment is seeing what you won't go in. It'd been better off for you not to see it. It'd been better off for you not to know what could happen. It would have been better off to, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? He says, man, watch what God says to him. He says, you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites. Your lack of trust in me has now undermined my trust in you. It hadn't changed my love, but it changes my trust. Because now your meltdown has said to me, I can't predict how you're going to behave in front of my people. Whatever you was feeling, you talked to me about everything else. I wish you would have let me and you handle that before you did that in front of them. Now you have so undermined your credibility that I'm robbed myself of my credibility if I keep you there. So now you put me in a position whether I got to choose between you or my credibility and what the people need to go to the next level is to know that I'm credible. They need to know I'm faithful to my word. They need to know I'll do exactly what I say. They need to know if I got to part a Red Sea, I'll part a Red Sea. If I've got to bring water out of a rock, I'll bring water out of a rock. If I got to make manna fall from heaven, I'll make manna fall from heaven. They need to know I'm credible. But what I want you to see, I got three minutes and 17 seconds. Come on, y'all, don't hold your amens. Here, here it is. Here it is. Can I have five more? Five more? All right, here it is. But here's what I want you to see. Moses mismanaged this moment, not because of immorality, but because of a meltdown. And this meltdown was a consequence of the compound effect. It seems random. It seems out of the ordinary. It seems like God's character is inconsistent with being gracious and long-suffering. But the truth of the matter is, this major meltdown was a consequence of the compound effect. This major meltdown was a result of Moses mismanaging minor meltdowns. Because this isn't the only meltdown Moses had. See, we're looking at Moses in numbers. But in the book of Exodus chapter number two, the Bible says this. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that way and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian, hid him in the sand. And the next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting and asked the, the one in the room, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? Wait a minute. He kills a man. He looks to see if anybody's looking. So it's not even impulsive. Did you hear what I just said? Got me? That's Exodus 2. 30 chapters later in Exodus 32, it says when Moses approached the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing and his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hand, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. You know what's happening in Exodus 32? He's just spent 40 days on Mount Sinai in the presence of God. The tablets that he had of stone had the Ten Commandments engraved upon them. You just spent 40 days in the presence of God. You got a word from God in your hand and you come back down, you see your team has allowed a golden calf to be uh, constructed. You are so upset, you break the word. Oh. 
but you just left. The presence, I mean, you were just, oh, da 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 You were just, oh, my, 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 see. You got in, you came down. Because you can't live on Sinai. At some point, you got to know how to behave right when you come down. You got to learn how to hold your tongue when you come down. You got to learn how to love people when you come down because you will not always be on Sinai. You see this pattern of meltdowns. And so the many meltdowns were intended by God to be a mirror in Exodus so there wouldn't be a problem in numbers. <laughs> See, when Moses killed that man, instead of burying the evidence, he should have did some investigation and asked himself, what is it in me that made me go from zero to 100 that fast? But instead of investigating the issue, he just hid the evidence. So he got discreet, but not delivered. He comes down from Mount Sinai. All he can see is what the people had done wrong, which was right. He was right. They had done wrong. But when he broke the tablets, he didn't pause to say, what is it in me that's got me responding like this? God, by his mercy, wanted the many meltdowns to happen in Exodus. Because it costs you more in numbers. He said, I'm trying to get you to see this before you get to the place in your life where there's no turning back. I want you to see this before you have the influence I'm going to give you. I want you to see this because we can deal with it in Exodus. It costs more in numbers. And what you don't deal with in Exodus will ruin you in numbers. And Moses took the mercy, but he missed the mirror. God said, I gave you mercy. I didn't let this kill you in Exodus. Not because I wanted you to keep doing it. I didn't let you kill this in Exodus. Let this kill you in Exodus. Because there's something I wanted you to see. And because he didn't deal with it in Exodus, he had to deal with it in Numbers. What started off as a struggle in Exodus turned into a stronghold in numbers. Stronghold, pastor, what's, what's that? Well, the apostle Paul uses this word in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 4, he says, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Then he gives us some commentary on what he means when he says strongholds. He says this, he says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. That's what the stronghold is. Arguments and pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Don't miss this because strongholds were literally fortresses. They were fences that would be built, built to keep enemy armies from invading a certain land. The wall of Jericho could be described as a stronghold. And what Paul says is strongholds are not just built in the ground. They are fences that we build in our mind. But Paul says they are arguments, they are ways of reasoning that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. It's a fence that's based on an argument you've constructed in your head that doesn't allow the knowledge of God to get through. 
So the stronghold is not the habit. The stronghold is not the addiction. The stronghold is not the behavior. The stronghold is the lie you told yourself that enables you to keep engaging in the behavior and that fence won't let truth get through. So your behavior perpetuates itself because the stronghold is set itself up against the knowledge of God. Strongholds are mindsets, unbiblical thinking patterns, value systems, ways of reasoning that keep us trapped in self-sabotaging behavior. The stronghold is not the habit. The stronghold is the way of reasoning. It's the argument that we've constructed in our mind that keeps God's truth from getting through to that area. See, I mentioned this in the first service. This is why in many spaces, believers aren't searching for churches that teach truth. They looking for churches that line up with their truth. And if there is a truth of God that doesn't line up with My way of reasoning, that stronghold, repels and rejects that truth. So if the stronghold is forgiveness is weak, when the word that is taught says forgive others as God has forgiven you, your stronghold rejects it. It only lets in truth you agree with. If the stronghold says, hate your enemies, and then the truth of God's word comes in and says, love your enemies, the stronghold rejects that truth. It only opens the gate for truth you agree with. I'm done, Tario. And it is those... It is, it is those lies that fueled Moses' behavior. It enabled it. it. Those lies, that way of reasoning fueled Moses' behavior because Moses had some of these issues before he got called. But his stronghold was a religious one because he probably thought, my calling is my healing. Did you hear what I just said? He probably thought when God showed his glory to me and when God sent me to Pharaoh that automatically addressed all of my issues. He didn't realize God using you is completely different than God fixing you. Him using you blesses somebody else's life. Him fixing you changes your own life. Why would you want to be used and not be fixed? Say, your anointing is not your healing. Say, you can be anointed. That anointing does not fix insecurity. Anointing does not fix comparison. Anointing doesn't fix hyperambition. Anointing doesn't fix hypersensitivity. Anointing doesn't fix territorialism. Being used isn't the same as being fixed. But that, that stronghold. Because even after he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock, He had just left laying prostrate on his face before God. Bible says him and Aaron were on their face and the glory of the Lord appeared among them. So there's his major meltdown was a result of the mismanagement of the minor ones. There were strongholds that he didn't deal with. See, we look at the fruit of Moses' behavior. But if he would investigate it, he would have saw, man, I don't really have an anger issue. See, there's a leadership theory called adaptive leadership. And the idea is leaders are action-oriented. And um, I adopt this theory. And so it can be real difficult for people who work with you when you adopt this theory because 
it means you resist the urge to act immediately because you understand right diagnosis precedes right prescription. So it means that even though you're action oriented, you're willing to pause and you're willing to, to take more time to diagnose so that you don't write the right prescription for the wrong problem. And that's the issue. It's not that worship don't work, but it don't work for everything. It's not that the word doesn't work. It just it don't work. It, 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 it's not the answer. Uh, just the preach word itself is not the answer to every issue. That some stuff won't be fixed by a sermon. You got to identify and uproot a stronghold before some sermons can even take root in your heart. And so when we look at Moses' issue, we see he's got an anger issue, but anger is a secondary emotion. You don't feel it first. You feel it second. You feel cheated, then you feel angry. You feel abused, then you feel angry. And when you look at Moses' life, he wouldn't have fixed his issues by fixing his anger. Because when you look at his life, he had a right to be angry. Anger is not a sin. Be angry, but sin not. Yes. Meaning be angry, but don't let your anger cause you to have a sinful response. Yes. Moses was probably wrestling with abandonment. Because most time, people don't know, a lot of people don't, or they forget that Moses was born in a time where a governmental leader, Pharaoh, was committing genocide against every Hebrew male boy that was born. Moses' mother, there's some new, there's something different on my baby. So she took him, hid him, put him in the Nile River. Coincidentally, Pharaoh's daughter, who was going down there to bathe, sees him, takes him, and says, I'm going to raise him as my own. I don't even have time to deal with this, but he's raised with a double consciousness because he is a Hebrew by ethnicity, but he's raised as an Egyptian. So he's dealing with this battle because I'm too Hebrew to be Egyptian, but I'm too Egyptian to be Hebrew. And I, I don't fit in. And so his mother released him to save him. The Bible says she nursed him, but she didn't raise him. So even though she released him for good reason, he still felt probably abandoned because he don't know the reason. He didn't know mama loved you too much to let her immaturity mess you up, so that's why she gave you to grandma. That mama loved you so much she wasn't willing to roll the dice. She ain't trust herself enough with you. All he knows is I was abandoned. He dealt with abandonment. He dealt with embitterment. This refers to the state with a feeling of becoming bitter or resentful. You can hear the resentment in his voice when he calls people rebels. And his resentment was a revelation of his disappointment. He is disappointed in their absence of appreciation for his sacrifice. He said, I was minding my own business. God come setting bushes on fire telling me to take my shoes off. He says, I ain't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. I was minding my business. And God disrupted my life and called me to this. And every time I turn around, y'all complaining. You prayed and asked God to get you out of Egypt. God tapped me on the shoulder, called me to lead you in an exodus out of Egypt. And as soon as we run into one problem in the wilderness, you saying it was better in Egypt. He says, I'm bitter because I'm sowing my life in the people I can't please. That I'm giving myself to people who don't know what it's costing me. And I'm not asking you to do to me what I do for you, but I want you to acknowledge and appreciate that this cost me my dream. This wasn't my dream. He 
dealt with abandonment. He dealt with embitterment. He dealt with discontentment. He has a state of dissatisfaction, of unhappiness, lack of fulfillment with his circumstance or his condition. It doesn't mean that he hadn't progressed. It meant that his progress had lined up with his picture for his life. Moses had to be thinking, with all the potential I have, this is what my life has come to. I can speak Egyptian and Hebrew, and this is what my life has come to. I'm not saying I hadn't progressed, but God, this can't be it. And him striking the rock is a revelation that he didn't have confidence that things would change in the future. It's one thing to know your situation is seasonal. It's another thing to feel like I'm stuck. And the abandonment, the embitterment, the discontentment led to anger and it produced a meltdown. When the abandonment and the embitterment and the discontentment are all strongholds that are being fed by lies. And if he identifies the lie, replaces the lie with truth, it uproots the stronghold. Because the abandonment issue the abandonment issue is fueled by the lie that I needed what I didn't have. That, that's the stronghold. Mama wasn't there the way you wanted her to be there. So I needed something I didn't have. But Moses doesn't become Moses. You missed it. Moses doesn't become Moses if she doesn't have enough spiritual sense to say, I got to put him in the Nile River to preserve him. He's telling himself a story, not realizing that if she had been who you wanted her to be the way you wanted her to be, you wouldn't be alive. And just because you wanted it didn't mean you have to have it. Just because you felt the void doesn't mean it's leaving you with a void. Just because you didn't have what you thought you should have had doesn't mean you turned out worse. God will take what the enemy meant for evil and work it for your good. He said, I did it without it. I did it anyway. I did it in spite of. Abandonment, the lie, I needed what I didn't have. Embitterment, embitterment, I reap, here's the lie, stronghold, I should reap where I sow. Bible says I reap if I sow, not where. You want to reap where you sow, but you don't always reap where you sow. Sometimes you sow in one field, but you reap in another. God says, you did it for them, but I'm going to touch somebody else and have somebody else do it for you. So just because appreciation is not coming from them doesn't mean it's not coming. Just because value is not coming from them doesn't mean it's not coming. Just because they don't have a revelation of the sacrifice you're making to add value to their life doesn't mean there isn't somebody somewhere. Because what somebody's taking for granted, he says, I got a whole tribe of people that's been praying for it. And I'm done. And the discontentment, here's a stronghold, here's a lie. Here's the fence. The discontentment is being fueled by this lie. That God can't be trusted with my happiness. I'm done. So I know you trust me to get, me, get you to heaven. But do you trust that I know what ultimately makes you happy? Because you think, Moses, your happiness is tied to the life you thought you should have. And you're thinking, if I would have never interrupted you with that burning bush, that your life would be much better than it is now. 
you're thinking without that interruption, you would be in a state of emotional bliss and satisfaction when you don't realize that when I rescue you from a dream that's not my dream from your life, I am rescuing you from, mis rescuing you from misery. Jesus put it this way, whoever tries to keep their life, you lose it. But if you're willing to lose it, you'll find it. Our time is up. But God, I feel this. God is making a request of some of you. We got to go, Tario. He's making a request of some of you. God is making a request of some of you. He's requiring from you the life you think you're supposed to have. He said, give me that. I'm at, huh, hear the word of the Lord. I am asking you for what was never yours anyway. It's not your life. It's mine. And I'm asking you to get that to me. Because if you give me the life you think you're supposed to have, then in exchange, I'll give you the life you were born for. Yeah. I'm done. But in the privacy of your own heart, this is, I, I know I felt that. This is some of your moment to surrender. To say, Lord, I really give you my life. Yep. Hey, Darius, law school, give me that. Give me that. I need that. And if I request something from you, I'll never give you anything inferior in exchange. So right now, I got to go. I want you in the privacy of your heart. them that thing you've been fighting to keep I hear this gosh that your clarity is tied to your surrender God's like I hadn't told you I don't tell you what until you give me a yes first and some of you have been looking for clarity from God regarding what this next season of your life should be like. And he said, I'm not giving you clarity until you resolve in, my, in your heart that the answer is yes before I even tell you what it is. Until you get to the point where you say, Lord, whatever it is, my answer. In the privacy of your heart, give him a yes. Thank you, Jesus.